the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus wants us to be bright and spicy. Not surprisingly, this appeals to me. I'm a guy who likes strong tastes. I use a lot of sriracha sauce in my cooking, and, and I love eating hot Mexican food and things like that. I terrorize my family by making things too spicy, probably for the rest of them. But, you know, I love strong tastes. So this gospel lesson today appeals to me a great deal. I'm going to illustrate what I think it means to be spicy and bright by starting with a counterexample. Uh, this week, I was at the corner store on the corner of Davenport and DuPont, uh, Caddy Corner, I'm sorry, uh, Davenport and Avenue Road, Caddy Corner across from the bank. And it's a little corner store there, and I was buying a lottery ticket. Yes, I do that from time to time, I'm sorry. So I was buying a lottery ticket, and as I walked in, there were these two ladies that were there who looked kind of out of place for uh, that particular market. They, they had on very elegant clothing, they had um, very expensive looking hairdos, and some very thick makeup on. Uh, and they were chatting with the woman who works there, and they were congratulating her, making small talk. They were congratulating her about her location being so close to a big uh, intersection of the city and, and with the bus traffic and so on, and that she must really do a lot of business there and so on. And she responded by saying that actually, uh, this isn't such a great location because she gets a lot of people who are either uh, mentally ill or very poor who come in and, and it makes her sometimes a little bit fearful. So their response to this was to say, oh, oh, oh dear. And she said something like, but, but I pray, I pray. Right? So then they said something like this. They, uh, one of them said, uh, oh, you pray. Uh, who do you pray to? Do you, do you pray to Jesus? Do you pray to Jesus? And she said, I, I pray to God. Yes, I pray to God. And so this one turned to her friend and said, see, Kim, she prays to the right one. <laughs> and she turned back and she said, she said, that's good. You pray to Jesus. You pray to Jesus because it says in the Bible that if you pray, he'll protect you and you'll be safe. And then just then their bus was pulling up. They were only there to, to warm up, of course. And, and frankly, I doubt they even bought anything from this poor lady. But anyway, they, they turned around and they got on the bus and they, and they left. And I kind of continued where they left off with the conversation. I, I said to her, I, I, I said, uh, she had mentioned 250 Davenport, which is a, a supportive housing building just near us. And I said, uh, I said, I thought things had gotten better there. Um, I know they have a new social worker working there. I'd heard that things had gotten better, their relationship with the city and other things had improved. And she said, no, no, same, it's the same. I said, well, oh, interesting. And then just then, I had a ride coming as well, and so, so I had to leave before I could get any deeper. But this encounter that I had bothered me on several different levels. Um, the first problem is that, you know, Christ died to take away sin, not to save us from bad luck. Um, Christ is not like an amulet that we put around our necks to protect us from bad things happening to us. And if you think the Bible is going to give you an argument about how if you follow Jesus, nothing bad is going to happen to you, then you obviously haven't read it very closely. Because Jesus himself said, you will be persecuted, you will die, bad things will happen to you. But when they do, put your hope on other things, testify with the word of the Spirit that's given to you, and so on and so on. So in other words... Jesus may promise to be with us in suffering, but he certainly does not promise to take it away. So that's the first sort of theological problem. Um, now, on the other hand, I don't think it's wrong to pray for God from deliverance from danger. And I, I mean, there's certainly a tradition of that in the Bible as well. People are all the time praying for God to save them. I myself have been in dangerous circumstances and made prayers of different kinds for God to save me from this circumstance or that. But I want to say that I think that is the most sort of basic level of faith. That is, that is just kind of the most basic sort of prayer that one can offer, and sometimes that's all one can manage, but that there's something quite a bit beyond that that God offers us in his abundance, and that we have to move on from sort of childish ways, you know, eventually as we move on in the faith. Here's the next problem. All right, so let's say that you could maybe start with someone who's fearful by proclaiming God as one that will protect them. Like that might be reasonable in some circumstances. The problem is that that version of God is far less crucified. You know, if, if we imagine Jesus as the great figure, well, that's one version of Christ, and I think he does come that way sometimes into our lives. But there's another Christ, the crucified one. And if you go to places where violence is a way of life, where people are in constant danger of dying from starvation or disease or violence, you will find that the dominant image of Christ is the crucified one. Because in those kinds of circumstances, when you don't know how long you're going to live, seeing as Jesus as the crucified one who's with you in those circumstances is a far 
more theologically deep place to be because it takes you into the reality of God's redemptional promise, which is beyond this life and transcends this life. It's kind of related to people who pray for wealth or happiness. It's not bad in and of itself, but there's so much more that God offers us in the crucified one than simple wealth, happiness, or even safety. C.S. Lewis famously was asked one time, if, if the gospel is so great and God's real and all that, how come Christians are sometimes unhappy? Like, how come they don't just live these lives of abundance and, 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 and wonderful things all the time? And his response was, why on earth should you be happy? <laughs> you know, basically, God does not promise you happiness. I, I've occasionally used that in marriage therapy with people, and they, they don't like it. Um, <laughs> But we are not necessarily promised happiness or promised truth or promised life. And life sometimes include those things that are unhappy. Annie Dillard uh, has this great quote. She said, she's a wonderful Christian author. She said, um, it might not be necessary to sit out in the dark. But if one wishes to see the stars, darkness is necessary. I love that image. You know, you can, you don't have to be outside looking for the stars. But if you wish to see stars, darkness is a prerequisite. All right, so those are some of the problems that, that I had with these ladies. Uh, basically, they, they left, and I was frustrated. They didn't really listen to this woman. They didn't actually ask her any questions, really. They just kind of, and they pushed her into that Jesus answer awfully quick. Like, I'm not sure that she really, really prays to Jesus or not. I think she was just saying yes to be, you know, affirmative, right? But so they, they left, and it occurred to me that in some ways, uh, if we're called to be a community of salt and light, I think what these ladies represented, and I, I shouldn't bash them too much, but I think what they represented was a kind of cheese topping, you know? Like, if, if, if life was a pizza, they were the cheese topping of God, this kind of layer of cheesiness that, that you know, may taste kind of good and satisfying, but it's not ultimately as nutritionally satisfying as what God promises us. I keep trying to convince my son there's more life than cheese, but, you know, I love cheese myself, I, don't get me wrong, but there's more to it than that. And I thought, okay, well, how does this community respond to something like the, the safety issues around 250 Davenport, for example? Well, actually, we've done some things. Um, Ann Stalker, you know, she comes and she talks a couple times a year. She raises money from our congregation. Um, I talk to her often about that place. We work together on the vision for her ministry there, uh, reaching out to young mothers, because that was a, a population that we could identify in that building that we could do something about. There are also members of that community who come to this church as well, right? There are things that we do that have real substance and depth to help that community. So, not cheesy at all. So this brings up an interesting question about, about what we do in response to this neighborhood. Uh, how is it that we're salt and light in this place? If that's some small examples of faithfulness, how can we go beyond that? How can we do even more, even richer response, and not just be spiritual cheese, but real salt and light? Well, as you know, there's a lot of missional initiatives that we're undergoing in this parish. Uh, we're trying to create a space of hospitality here that would welcome all people into our midst and to offer them the kind of generosity with no strings attached uh, that Jesus would have offered if he was here. Part of my reason for doing that, and now we're going to get into a bit of a theory thing, uh, is something called the missional cycle. Basically, uh, churches go through this cycle that's shaped kind of like a, a, a figure eight on its side. Uh, this was uh, uh, worked out by a guy named Alan Roxborough, who's, who's a, a friend of John um, uh, McClaverty, who was a member of this congregation at one time. And, and John and, and Alan and others have been doing research about why churches all over the world seem to be facing so much crisis. And their basic thesis is that it's because things change. Ooh, surprise. Uh, the world is changing, and as it does, the structures that we've designed for one circumstance no longer fit in the new circumstance. And so there's this figure eight diagram, which uh, I first read about about eight or nine years ago. And at this point, I think I should just have it kind of tattooed on the inside of my arm, like a cheat sheet, you know, because a lot of what we've been doing here has been based on this work of Alan Roxborough. Uh, he wrote a book called The Missional Leader, which has been very formative for a lot of people around the world who are doing this kind of change. Anyway, so the figure eight works like this. If you imagine the church as being sort of successful, it's got its structures in place, it has awesome worship, everyone loves the preaching, all that good stuff, it's sort of on an upward, upward hill, right? They start attracting members, uh, they have more resources to do things, uh, more money, more volunteers, all that stuff. Then as the world changes underneath them, those structures start to become maladaptive. People start to move on and join other congregations. The, the, the music starts to decline. The worship isn't so rich anymore and so on. And then people start focusing on trying to uh, 
perform. They, they, they focus on those things that they did in the past and making them as excellent as possible. So they start reinvesting in things like worship and preaching and so on and trying to get better at the things that used to attract people. But the problem is that doesn't really work for very long. And so things start to decline and you get this point of crisis where the old structures are no longer possible even to sustain. Um, in, in extreme examples, this manifests in churches that can no longer even support their buildings. You know, because the buildings are falling apart, they were created to support a kind of community that's no longer there. And they're in a point of crisis, they don't have the money to sustain them, and so they go through the back end of this uh, figure eight. But uh, if churches are going to survive and not simply die, uh, this thing happens at that point of crisis where they begin to adapt and do new things. They start doing what is possible. They start asking, well, we can't support the building anymore, what can we support? Well, you know, we have this little side chapel on the side, and maybe if we just do our worship in there, and we, we rent out the rest of the church to, to you know, the, the local dance group or something, uh, then we can sustain ourselves, right? Churches make those kinds of decisions. And with that, they begin to enter into a period of creativity and flexibility, because they have no other choice. No other choice. And then you get to a point called the emergence area, where they start being pioneering and creative and coming up with new ideas, and they start to get some energy and excitement again, and then you come to a point on the back end of the figure eight of choice, where the congregation, where the community has to make a choice. And that choice is basically uh, to either turn back and run away from all the changes and pioneering work or to move forward in them. And then you get to the back end of that pioneering thing where it enters into real community building and, and the real work of building up a new program and a new congregation, new community, and then things start to swing up again until, of course, that becomes maladaptive, the changing circumstances, and you do the whole cycle over and over again. So in his book, uh, he points out that one of the things that we have to recognize is that there's sort of two modes of change. One is incremental and one is disruptive. Uh, bless you. In the case of incremental change, what you're talking about is sort of gradual, iterative changes. You're talking about tweaks, just little changes to the structure or to uh, what's going on, the program, whatever. And he says the problem with incremental change is that only works when you're in that performative zone, when you're hitting on all cylinders and you're meeting the needs of people and everything's awesome. Then you can make small incremental changes and appreciate success based on them. But as soon as what you're doing has become maladaptive to the new environment, those kinds of incremental changes won't help you. Uh, that actually what you need is a large disruptive change that spins everything around and makes all things new. Uh, in the case of that woman down at the corner store, uh, there's not a lot of band-aid solutions, little things, little tweaks that we could make that would make her feel safe at that corner store. Right? There's not much that we could do as a community to do that. There's not much that I can think of that like, a city could do. Right? It's going to take something quite a bit bigger. I have no idea what it is, but a new thing would have to happen. Uh, I'll give you an example that was proposed by the city a while back. They actually talked about demolishing that building. They talked about leveling the whole thing right? and, and building and spreading the people that live there out in a much larger area. I mean, things like that. That's an example of disruptive change. They're not going to do that, but that was an idea that was put out there uh, some years ago. In the case of church land, things have changed so rapidly in the environment underneath us, in the communities that we live, like this neighborhood, that I think the only choice is disruptive change. The only choice is to mix things up. But here's the good news. In doing so, I think we're being faithful to Jesus. He said, be salt and light. He said, be salt and light. Be bright and spicy. What does that look like? We're going to put it this way. Jesus' followers are commanded and enabled by Jesus to surpass covenantal and institutional righteousness. Say it again. Jesus' followers, us, are commanded and enabled to surpass covenantal and institutional righteousness. In other words, we're asked to go not just fulfill the law, but to go beyond it. And when we talk about... Uh, you know, surpassing the covenantal and institutional righteousness. What we're saying is something about how, you know, the covenant that Isaiah speaks of that we heard about this morning, that it's all about love, mercy, and justice. The, the restoration of Israel is not just about restoring the laws, Isaiah wants to say. It's about restoring justice. It's about restoring mercy and love. We have to surpass the Pharisees. We have to surpass the Sadducees in their righteousness. So, how do we begin by doing this? Well, we begin, as I have said often, by listening to the needs of this neighborhood and beginning to respond to them. And that's what we've been working on for years here, really. But really, the intensity of that has picked up in the last year or so. So, uh, at some point today, you might want to look in the back of the leaflet. There's a, a, a half of an article in there that I found particularly good 
that it goes into a lot of depth about what we're talking about when we talk about fresh expressions, when we talk about missional church. It's, it's, it's kind of heady, but it's good, okay? And it kind of gives some of the vocabulary and some of the logic of it. I tell you, you know, the church has been working on this problem of adaptive change for a while. And this stuff is really, really rich. Um, the research that's been coming out that I've mentioned before has shown that it's bearing fruit, which is, as Jesus would say, one of the good tests of something that you think comes from the Spirit. Does it bear good fruit? Yes. Uh, I forget what the exact percentage is, but right now it's something like 26 to 30 percent of the people attending church in the Church of England are attending at a Fresh Expressions community. <laughs> that is a remarkable change in a short period of time relatively speaking for how things move in church land so you know as a community i'm inviting us into that saltiness and into that brightness uh, that kind of um, that kind of disruptive change that really mixes things up and does something special and the thing about the salt you know that salt is just something which is so subtle that spiciness in there it's not cheese layered on top it's something that infuses the entire environment and like the salt kind of gets into every part of the dish, I would hope that we could get into every part of people's lives. And we start by doing hospitality, just welcoming them in and seeing what those needs might be. So I've hit you with quite a bit of theory today. So, so let's, uh, let's open this up a bit and see what people